when a murder is discovered. She was in the bathtub where the killer had placed her. It just looked bad. It doesn't just destroy one life. I couldn't understand why. Why would somebody do such a terrible thing? It tears communities apart. You can still speak to residents now and they say they've never got over it. What happened to a young man in the midst of their little community here? It's up to the police to not only solve the mystery. That was our hope, that where we were going was going to provide us with a treasure chest of information. And track down the killer, but bring them to justice. The absence of a head or hands in an investigation like this can impede identification, but it certainly doesn't make it impossible. In this episode, a 38-year-old woman goes missing, but is believed to have been killed. It was a massive shock, a real shock, I think, for a small city like Exeter to think that something like this could have happened. We deal with dead bodies all the time, well, however, not many are in this condition. Meet the murder detectives. What you have is a young lady who is in a suitcase which has been deposited on a railway embankment and covered over by twigs and other foliage. Who reveal how they caught the killer. It was DNA, it was phone analysis, it was forensics. The police brought an arsenal of investigative tools. The cathedral city of Exeter in Devon lies on the picturesque River X and has been an important centre for the area since Roman times. On August the 8th, 2016, a seemingly routine report came in to Exeter Police Station. We were working on the evening that the uh, missing person report um, was passed to us to look at. Due to finish at 10 o'clock, and, and like a lot of police shifts, sometimes things don't go as you expect. You're never quite sure what's going to happen, what's going to come in, and it's one of those evenings, and something didn't look right from the outset. Detective Darren Webb and Deputy SIO Martin Sutcliffe picked up the case two days later. I was approached about a missing person called Gagana Prodnova and the fact that there were um, certain concerns and worries about whether or not it was simply a missing person inquiry um, or whether or not we had something more sinister. Martin and Darren were told the missing woman was a 38-year-old Bulgarian called Gagana Prodnova. She worked at a local hotel. Zenia Nikolova was a friend and colleague from the hotel. She shared a lot of things from her life before England, in general. She was pretty chatty. <laughs> Each morning when I go online to check on messages, if anything happened overnight, I got a message from her, which was really bizarre. Just reading it was so weird. It, there were so many things that doesn't match. And she was telling me that her mom passed away and everything happened so quickly, so she flew back to Bulgaria and she doesn't know when she's going to be back. The text message didn't ring true. When Gagana didn't turn up for work, Zenya tried to call and left several messages, but she didn't respond. We all start worrying. As on the movies, we just had to wait 72 hours and we phoned the police. Exeter is regarded by locals as a safe place to live. The case was treated seriously. This is coming into Exeter city centre. Crime levels are managed, I think, really well. There are challenges and there are areas of, of crime that always need to be looked at and, and addressed, but relatively, I would hope people would enjoy living in Devon and Cornwall. Anne-Marie also worked at a local hotel and had heard about Gagana's disappearance. You don't hear of things like that in Exeter. Very, very rare you hear of things like that. It's very safe. You can walk the streets of Exeter very safely, 10, 11 o'clock at night. It's a very nice place. When Martin took on the case, Gagana had been missing for four days. 
This is the major incident room at Exeter, and when a case breaks, like it did in, in um, Kagana's um, case, obviously, it requires an awful lot of, uh, of attention and a number of police resources, so they'd all converge in this room. They began a proof-of-life investigation, which looks at the missing person's lifestyle to see if there had been any recent abnormal activity. The vast majority of the information, and particularly when you looked at a lady that had a lot of contact with people in Bulgaria and phone calls being made, all that had stopped, and this is a lady with three children. That in itself was extremely worrying. The team learned that Gagana's three children were being looked after by their father's family in Bulgaria, while she was working in the UK. She said that financially they struggle in Bulgaria and the mother is uh, not very well, so they needed more money to, to cover bills and everything, to take care of the family. So that's why she came over. Gagana had separated from her partner and had come to the UK. She had been in the country for less than eight months. We found Gagana to be nothing other than a, a very hard-working individual. Everybody would say that about her. She was very dedicated to her job. She would work hard. She loved her children and she loved her family. Gagana simply would not turn up to work. By this stage, she'd not turned up for a few days. So all these things obviously were of concern and were part of a consideration as to what we should then do. Martin began to trace Gagana's last movements. She had a boyfriend in Exeter, so he brought him to the station for questioning and asked him to confirm when he had last seen Gagana. The new partner gave a full and open account about their plans for that particular day. Gagana was going food shopping, then planned to see her boyfriend to cook dinner for him, but she hadn't turned up. The first message he received was around the time that they were due to meet, and that message was certainly written in haste and littered with, with mistakes and didn't seem to make sense to him at that time. Martin made a note of the strange message and checked out the boyfriend's story. Everything that he mentioned seemed to fall into place when he spoke to other people that had contact with Gagana. It looked like the boyfriend was not going to be able to provide any leads about Gagana's last 24 hours. The, the, the last person to see anybody alive is, is really significant in an investigation because they hold a lot of information. Devon and Cornwall CID had taken statements from Gagana's friends and colleagues which revealed worrying information about her relationship with the father of her children, a man called... Costed in Kostov. She suffered a lot in her life. Like, in the family, being abused physically. And her partner, I should say, he's been abusive, like, all their life together. Gagana and Kostov had been together for more than 15 years in Bulgaria, but she had left him to start a new life in Exeter. The general public tend to believe that um, abusive relationships evolves around um, primarily physical violence, whereas actually that's not the case. In a large amount of cases, it can be psychological, so where the perpetrator is controlling the victim through intimidation, coercion. Gaslighting, for example, is where the victim can be so convinced that they are in the wrong that their uh, perception of reality completely changes. The team discovered 42-year-old cleaner Kostov was no longer living in Bulgaria. He had followed Gagana to the UK and moved himself into her tiny bedsit. He too was brought in for questioning. When Kostin Kostov was interviewed, what he was saying to police was Gagana did come home, um, he remembers that. She was in possession of shopping. But what he went on to say was that she took a phone call when she was there. And when she took that phone call, demeanor changed, and she explained to him that her mother had died in Bulgaria, and so she needed to leave in order to sort out, obviously, that, that family matter. He also went on to say that he had given her £250 in order to help her make her way. As with the boyfriend's story, 
the detectives thoroughly checked out Kostov's version of events. And we looked at financially. She was actually paid a lot better than he was. And when I looked at his means to give her that money, it didn't make any sense. That account didn't stack up. And there were immediate suspicions about his involvement and disappearance. With Kostov already at the station being questioned, the team investigated his claim that Gagana had left for Bulgaria. Just looking into the timings, it wasn't possible for Gagana to get to the airport in the time that Kostadin was suggesting. Looking at her mobile phone records, seeing where text messages had been sent from, where was it at the time these messages were being sent. Those things suggested that Gagana's phone was in Exeter at the time where Kostov had said that she was on her way to the airport. It's not true. She was, uh, well, at least her mobile phone was in Exeter. They also contacted her family in Bulgaria. And we were able to ascertain really quite quickly, and with the help, obviously, of the Bulgarian community, her mother was still alive. Martin and the team looked at the evidence before them. Gagana had been reported missing four days ago, and the Proof of Life team had not been able to find any trace of her. Kostadin Kostov was lying about her last known movements. That's when a decision is made. He should be arrested on suspicion of Gagana Prodanova's murder. In August 2016, in Exeter Police Station, a missing person report about hotel worker Gagana Prodanova had now become something much more serious. One of the main shifts in the inquiry came from it moving, obviously, first of all, missing person, then to a, to a murder inquiry. A huge consideration was certainly the fact it was a no-body murder. Now officially a murder inquiry, Martin formed a team of officers. Head of forensics was Ivor Lloyd. Uh, after Costa was actually arrested, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act initially gives us 24 hours to investigate the crime. That meant there was great pressure on us to try and find something substantive forensically or Gagana or her body within that time before he had to be released. Ivor and the team's first port of call was the flat Gagana shared with Kostov in the hope it would reveal evidence of her life or death. It was a small flat, it must have been very difficult living there, especially with a former partner. Um, it was tidy, um, she was a hard-working lady. It didn't appear there had been much of disturbance, but of course it had been several days since the disappearance. Her suitcase is still there, her backpack is still there, toothbrush is still there. There was Bulgarian currency there. This was further evidence that Gagana hadn't left the country. But the flat didn't reveal the forensic clues Ivor was hoping for. There was certainly no evidence of any blood pattern in the, in the flat. What was there was the items Gagana had purchased in the shop on the night of her disappearance. As we looked at the natural route that Gagana would have taken, um, we became aware of the fact she stopped at a food store on the way home. The team found Gagana on CCTV at the shop. The ingredients she bought were in the flat, but the clothes she was wearing were not. It made it very, very suspicious. It was evident, unfortunately, that Gagana had probably come to a, a tragic end. Kostov had already been in custody for 24 hours, so the team had to apply to the magistrate's court for an extension to hold him longer without charge. If they didn't get it, Kostov would be released. The enormity of taking on an inquiry where there's no body can't really be understated. Um, all the inquiries you'd normally have to do obviously still exist, but you're also having to determine with absolute certainty and convince people that Gagana is no longer with us without having that physical evidence. The magistrate granted the extension. Martin had 48 hours left to prove Kostadin Kostov murdered Gagana. Her friends were in shock that Gagana had gone. My hopes were that he probably been so abusive to beat her up so she cannot just show up on the next day. But she didn't show up in a couple of days, right? Sorry. The 
this is my hope that she's gonna be all right. Just, just, just hiding. The press were now aware of the missing person investigation and Martin and the team were hoping that the public might now help to build up a picture of Gagana's movements. There was an appeal to find Gagana. We were aware that a woman had gone missing and as a news organisation we helped as best we could. It's part of our role in these circumstances to help the police to find any information they can. We put out a picture, uh, there was CCTV of her final movements and we did everything we could to try and attract the public's attention to see if Gagana could be found safe and well. We were under enormous pressure and had to work at full tilt in order to harvest as much as we possibly could. They already had strong circumstantial evidence, but each line of inquiry would have to be investigated in greater detail. The background of the domestic violence, the dynamic you've got, there is a motive the lack of contact with the, the family. On top of that, you've got someone who is passing you false information about what has happened in the lead up to her disappearance. Martin put a large team on to trawl six days of CCTV for signs of Gagana or Kostov in Exeter. Digital media investigators analyzed Kostov's phone and the proof of life team looked at Gagana's behavior since her disappearance. So as far as proof of life was concerned, the one potential anomaly was the fact that there were messages going out from Gagana's phone after the time that we were quite sure that she was dead. Gagana's friend Zenya and her new boyfriend had both received messages on the night she disappeared. The message I got is on Cyrillic, which is our alphabet, and her phone doesn't have a Cyrillic. She always uses the English alphabet. The contact Gagana's boyfriend had with her on the night she disappeared was also unusual. The new partner talked about the fact that there was never a voice call, and he requested a voice call. You know, what is this message? Call me. That never happened. Head of forensics Ivor Lloyd had to keep all options open. Most of our attention was trying to identify where Gagana was, where her clothing was from the night that she was wearing, where any possible weapon might be. A laptop had been recovered from her flat, but her phone was missing. As we start to look at the phone, it hasn't travelled anywhere, not outside of the extra area. So we had a dedicated team that looked into that side of the inquiry. Through amazing diligence on their part, they were able to inform us that messages sent to both Gagana's boyfriend and work colleague Xenia had originated from or from the very close whereabouts of Kostov's flat. It was a revelation. That wasn't all. The digital media investigation revealed another vital piece of evidence. There was a SIM swap and there was a SIM card that was placed into Gagana's phone. And the work that was done by the inquiry team showed that we could attribute that SIM card to Kostin Kostov. Every photograph, every message that you send, it's all data that's available for an investigator. In this case, it was beneficial to the investigation because they were able to show where he was when the phone was being used. They were able to show that the SIM card had been changed over into a different phone. And the one conclusion is that he's actually killed her or he knows something about her death. Martin presented this to Kostov, who was in custody. Why is your SIM going into her handset? at a time that we believe that she's dead, or certainly missing, or you're trying to purport to us that she's in Bulgaria. So those key powerful questions were asked, and Kostin Kostov never ever gave a satisfactory answer as to why that was the case. As the investigation continued, Martin and the team learned more about Gagana's life with Kostov. She suffered all her life, gave birth of three kids, lovely, kids and left everything that she knows and everyone that she knows back home to go in a foreign country that she doesn't know anyone 
for her to actually move her entire life here and try and start a life would have been an enormous challenge. Could be that she was fearful for her own life. Maybe she wanted to remove herself from a toxic situation for the benefit of her children. He was contrived, controlled and really callous. Uh, he spoke about Gagana like she was an object. What you have is an ex-partner who is controlling, abusive, who has come across to this country in order to seek Gagana out, is aware of the fact that there is a new relationship. And in effect, what's happening is he's losing control of, of Gagana. And in domestic violence situations, it's a very dangerous dynamic. He would probably most likely be starting to feel very, very desperate. When coming to England and actually moving into her flat, he probably, to begin with, was very likely to start to evoke power and control over it all over again. And for her, that must have been quite devastating. Gagana's friends told police that from the moment Kostov had arrived in the UK, he had forced himself into her life. There was an incident after a barbecue that was held at the new partner's address where he broke up her phones and, I think, tore up a fair amount of her clothing. Once she'd seen that, a reminder of what she'd faced in her past, that was a key turning point where she wouldn't even consider going back and, and didn't even stay at that address anymore because she didn't want to be around Kostov and Kostov. The 72 hours were nearly up and they still hadn't found a body. But Martin never wavered in his belief. We were confident we'd prove that one Gagana had died, and secondly, that someone had taken on her identity after she died. Martin and the team presented their case to the Crown Prosecution Service, who would decide if there is enough evidence to charge. The CPS lawyer agreed with the police position. Kostadin Kostov was charged with the murder of Gigana Prodanova. We were aware that a suspect eventually had been arrested, but really we were on the, the outside looking in. When a major crime like that happens, Devon and Cornwall Police, the major crime investigation team, they keep things very close to their chest. Ivor Lloyd and his forensics team continued to search for Gagana's body a member of the public that was travelling adjacent to a railway line in Exeter city centre, smelt an unpleasant odour and reported it to the police. Ivor went to investigate. I arrived, parked up and instantly could smell something coming across the road actually from all the distance. I could see down there in the undergrowth sticks and twigs stacked up but unnaturally and cut as opposed to falling off trees and they appeared to be camouflaging something black and when I got closer I could see it appeared to be a roll along suitcase. From that suitcase I could see there was damage to it and there was some sort of fluid dripping from the suitcase and maggots coming out of the suitcase. Uh, it was extremely unpleasant. Could this be Gagana's body? left to rot in the undergrowth next to the railway line. Ivor and the team were about to find out. In the Devon city of Exeter, Kostadin Kostov had been charged with the murder of his ex-partner, Gagana Prodanova. Gagana had been missing for some period of time and, and, if our assessment was correct, dead for a considerable period of time. Her suitcase had been found near the railway line and there was a rotten smell in the air. Head of forensics Ivor Lloyd concluded it was coming from the case. I was fairly sure that something had died within the suitcase. Um, in the circumstances we had, I started to form a hypothesis that the body within the suitcase could very well be Gagana. Uh, at that stage, I didn't want to disturb anything, so I summoned a CSI to photograph the scene and record it as it was. I went down to the suitcase and I pulled the suitcase out of its ID hole up onto a flatter part of ground uh, to see what we could see. Uh, I didn't want to open it here in the outdoors. I wanted it secured and controlled in a mortuary environment. 
Ivor informed Martin and the team back at HQ of what had been found. They were hoping the suitcase could answer a lot of questions. What can we determine about how she may have been killed? Um, which is why you then have, obviously, a forensic post-mortem dealt with by a home office pathologist who will go through in fine detail and try and give as many answers as they can in respect of what happened to, to the deceased. We deal with dead bodies all the time, obviously, by virtue of the job we do. However, thankfully, not many are in this advanced, decomposed condition. This was extremely trying for the team, very unpleasant notwithstanding the circumstances, but just actually uh, the state of the body itself. Many thousands of maggots were coming out of the body bag, uh, so it was quite a challenging post-mortem examination. So decomposition is a continuous process um, of varying stages that produce different scents, different chemical compounds, different gases. We break the continuous process of decomposition down into five stages, the latter two being advanced or post-decay and moving towards dry remains. The climb at that time and the temperature was high. Um, she's in effect in a microclimate within the suitcase and so deterioration is more rapid. Once we opened the case, we could quite clearly see what appeared to be a female's body in advanced stages of decomposition inside the case. In extended periods of decay and decomposition can inhibit the process of identification, but they don't impede it entirely. They certainly don't make it impossible. So from even um, dry remains, completely decomposed with no soft tissue, we can still look to establish things relating to the biological identity of the individuals. So in the end, the identification of Gagana to the body in the case was done through DNA. We looked at the toothbrush, which we retrieved from her home flat, and then we compared it to DNA from tissue from the body, and it indeed matched, and it was the Ghana. The police activity in the area had attracted a lot of attention, and the local community became aware of their discovery. A body had been discovered on a railway embankment in Exeter, that's when we first knew that an incident, a tragedy of some sort, had occurred. What we didn't know at that stage was the background. The team had found Gagana, but the lack of forensic evidence meant they couldn't link her body to their prime suspect, her ex, Kostov. What you have is a young lady who is in a suitcase, which has been deposited on a railway embankment and covered over by twigs and other foliage. How many cases of natural causes would end up with that scenario? The state of the body meant that the pathologist couldn't determine much else. We were left in a situation where actually we had no confirmed cause of death. We weren't able to say definitely how Gagana was killed or how she died. Having now identified Gagana, Martin and the team could now tell her family and friends that she was not missing. Most importantly, the family could have a Christian burial and could mourn their lost one in a way that they needed to. It's horrific, the news, but the, the position is then definite. We expected to hear that maybe, you know, she had gone off with someone or, you know, she was safe and well, but then to hear that, you know, she had actually died, it was... A real shock, a real, real shock. We sent reporters to the railway embankment, the, the road next to where the body was found, and we knocked on doors. It's part of the journalist's job to get as much information as you can. If you can't find anything concrete out about the actual incident itself, it's common practice to ask people in the street. And, of course, they were worried, but the general reaction was one of, of puzzlement, Officers began searching through CCTV near the railway siding, hoping to see the suitcase being dumped, while Martin continued to search the area for physical evidence. When Gagana was found, she was naked, and so part of your consideration there is 
obviously where, where are Gagana's clothes? They could see the clothes Gagana had been wearing at the time she disappeared on the CCTV footage from the shop she was last seen in. We took a decision to recover what we could in the way of waste, domestic waste, in and around the area where we believe she went missing. What happens with a lot of investigations, sometimes you need a bit of luck. The investigators in this particular case took the opportunity to stop the bin collection and then collect all the bins up and then go and search through the many tonnes of rubbish. When you're going bag to bag, it takes a, a lot of determination and will to, to move through and keep your focus and concentration as it needs to be. Their breakthrough came when they found a bin bag that contained not just clothes, but shopping bags like the ones Gagana had been seen carrying. The actual bin bag, when they explored it, was open up and within that was a blue bag. Its appearance was remarkably good for a match for the shopping that she got from the Best One International store. The clothes were also a match to Gagana's. Finding the, the garments that were exactly the same as Gagana was wearing on the night she disappeared was brilliant. When the items were found uh, at the refuse tip uh, and photographed uh, and seized by CSIs, it became evident that they were all actually cut off the uh, victim when she was undressed rather than just being taken off. Within the same bin bag were other items they felt they could test for DNA evidence. There were cans located within that bin bag as well and a Jack Daniels bottle. So all of that potentially can, can harvest something for us. Kostov was still in custody, so police continued to search the flat he shared with Gagana. When the suspects are brought in for questioning, under the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, samples are collected. So these things, in this case, like swabs, would have been taken to look for any kind of DNA, perhaps blood samples. I suspect that they were looking to be able to find a connection between the suspect and either the scene of the crime or the victim. In Kostov and Gagana's flat, officers found a pair of scissors. They, along with the cut clothes found in the rubbish bags, were sent for forensic examination. An assessment was made by a forensic scientist about whether those scissors made those cuts, and that came back positive. In addition to that, we looked at the garments for DNA. On the leggings, we found blood, which was identified as coming from Costas. More DNA tests were done on the beer cans found in the rubbish, again looking for a link with Kostov. Certainly the Carlsberg can was examined to see if the drinker, if you like, could be identified. And again, there was a full profile. A uh, huge moment. That was a point where I allowed myself to be at least slightly content with the way it was going. Martin and the team had now connected Kostov with Gagana's body. Officers examining CCTV of the area had also got a result. The suspect was identified dragging a roll-along suitcase in the early hours of the morning away from Gagana's home address and then for quite a short time later coming back without the case. The suitcase seems to be way above a weight which would ordinarily be involved when, um, well, I don't know, some people like to pack particularly heavy, but it was to the point of being ridiculous. They were convinced the man seen in the CCTV pulling the suitcase was Kostov and confronted him with the footage. He refused to admit this or accept it during an interview. With the CCTV and all the other evidence found at the flat, Martin and the team felt they had enough to go to court. You can't be 100% certain about how things are going to go. I mean, it really was one thing after another. There were so many different areas of evidence which showed it was categorically Kostov that committed this um, terrible crime. Everything pointed towards him. Thirty-eight-year-old Gagana Prodanova had been found dead in a suitcase dumped near the railway line in Exeter, Devon. 
for months on end, myself, the case officer, and those at the core of the inquiry were basically working at full tilt, like a war of attrition, trying to get everything done. Um, and it was one of the most demanding periods I've ever had in my police career. The police had found CCTV footage that they believed showed Kostadin Kostov moving the suitcase containing Gagana's body from her flat to the railway siding. He's not dressed in his normal clothing. He wore a baseball cap, a very tight top, and tried to present physically in a different way to what he ordinarily would be seen on the CCTV. So we know that when Costin dumped Regana's body um, over the embankment, um, that he was caught on CCTV walking away, almost strutting and looking almost pleased with himself. I think what we have to remember is it's not necessarily the act of murder that he's feeling pleased about. It's the fact that he has, in his mind, been able to regain power. He's been able to regain control over her. They didn't consider... It could be somebody else. Plus the fact the individual coincidentally walks the vast majority of the distance back to the home address of Kostin Kostov. All that obviously helps paint a picture of who may be responsible. With this video evidence, Kostov's DNA found on Gagana's abandoned clothes and proof Kostov had been using her phone, the police felt they had enough to try him for murder. So after months of preparation and getting the case together, obviously we moved to the trial phase, and this trial was held at, at Exeter Crown Court. On April the 20th, 2017, in Exeter Crown Court, the trial began. The murder trial in Exeter is a big event. It was an extraordinary case because there were two bombshell moments, the first being when the prosecution showed the CCTV of, of Kostov walking through the town in the dead of night with the suitcase with a body inside it. It's obviously a very unusual event that someone to choose to, to take their body through a city centre at all. I think there was an element of thought and planning around it because people walking through this city with suitcases is not that unusual an event. There are a huge number of the cameras available to us, which obviously are very useful when you're carrying out criminal investigations. When Kostov was confronted with the CCTV image of the man with the suitcase, his lawyers said that as no face was visible, it couldn't be proved it was Kostov. The way the police chose to prove that was to compare images of the defendant, Kostov, on other days as he's making his way to and from work in those locations through Exeter with images of this man with the baseball cap and the suitcase. And they actually brought a man into court who studied how people walked. This was gait analysis. He went into extreme detail about head movements, arm movements, torso movements, rotation of the knee movements. I mean, who knew these people existed? And the conclusion was that it was overwhelmingly likely that the man in the baseball cap was Costa. The police also presented their telephone evidence that showed that Kostov had sent text messages to Gagana's friends and family, pretending they were from her. Kostov made it quite clear, to me anyway, and I think to the court, that he was trying to portion blame elsewhere and was certainly looking towards the, the new partner that, that she had. So as he started to give his testimony and we started to talk about some of the messaging, he actually started to suggest that Gagana was involved in that, that she actually sent messages um, with a view to getting him in trouble. The only trouble in this investigation uh, was that he was going to be arrested for her murder. He did try and suggest that whilst at the flat, it must have been Gagana or another that were actually sending messages. When the prosecution said, how on earth do you expect us to believe that it was Gagana sending these messages? He was the person sending them all along, it was obvious. And to suggest that Gagana was still alive sending messages in her name was ridiculous, to be honest. After the prosecution had laid out their case, Kostov himself gave evidence in his defence. 
it's always a high point of a trial when the defendant gives his evidence because you know very quickly after he opens his mouth and answers these allegations whether or not he's got a case or not. The way he spoke in there, on occasions he actually he broke into a smile and a laugh whilst being questioned. That's the person that you're dealing with. That's unbelievable. There was an arrogance there. Did he think he could pull this off? Some people have that narcissistic type of personality where they think, I'm the smartest individual in the room. I will work my way through this. I've done it before. I'll do it again. He just would not budge from his view that it must be somebody else that he did it. He always seemed to portray that he was a victim somehow of, of this entire scenario and that everything was Gagana's fault. By tracking Kostov's phone and those movements with the CCTV footage, police showed he had returned to the suitcase some days after it was dumped. It was explained that Kostov had returned to the scene of where the suitcase was and he'd made this search on his phone using the Bing search engine. The most powerful piece of evidence, arguably, and, and the impact you could see it had in the court came from the, the Bing search that was conducted by him on his mobile phone. How long does it take? for a human corpse to decompose. Lord knows what he was thinking when he made this search because the police, when they went back to examine the evidence, could clearly look at his search history because he was at the scene where the body was. He was standing literally metres away from where Gagana was decomposing in a suitcase. So why would you make that search? Well, you can imagine how explosive or damning that is as, as a piece of evidence when the jury hear that. The court case took five weeks. In the end, it was down to the jury to decide whether Kostov was guilty of the murder of Gagana. One of the challenges is that you almost have to be able to demonstrate how somebody died. Gagana's body was found in a suitcase, so it was quite clear that it wasn't natural. You know, so the, the, that in itself helped. They can't say that it's a murder because there's no sign of violence, but by the same token, is it an accident? It's quite clear she was murdered. It's quite clear that she was put into a suitcase and transported to that location, to the deposition site. It probably wasn't as big an issue because of those reasons that they, they couldn't establish how she died. So I was there for the duration of the trial. Trials are always very nerve-wracking experiences. I think he, he possibly did think he could get away with it. I don't think he had any sense of the reality of standing in a witness stand in the UK trying to prove yourself to a jury of 12 men and women when you're faced with such a compelling case. At every stage when the prosecution presented its evidence, he was simply moving a step closer to the prison cell. Once all the evidence had been heard, the judge sent the jury out to consider their verdict. It's almost like you take a breath. The dynamic has changed. You've gone through, you've done everything you possibly can. I've sat through hundreds of trials and you never know until that verdict comes whether or not the jury sees the case in the way that you see it. A person's liberty is at stake here. Everything has to be taken seriously. So when the verdict is delivered, it is high drama. It's pure theater in a sense. Under 90 minutes later, they came back into court and were unanimous in a guilty verdict. It really was such a strong case. And so the relief is even greater because it would just be a horrendous miscarriage of justice if he was able to walk the streets knowing what we knew about him um, in the fullness of Kostovin's, Kostov's character. It, it just wouldn't have been right for any other verdict other than murder and guilty. The motive for this case was as old as the hills. It was jealousy. If he couldn't have her, obviously no one else could. And that's the unfortunate thing. But he's in the right place, and I think we all feel a lot safer that he is there. And maybe people will learn something from this case, let's say it. People should not accept abuse, mental or physical abuse, you should change it, immediately cut it off. Don't wait for something bad to happen.
when a murder is discovered. And what you have is a young lady who is in a suitcase which has been deposited on a railway embankment and covered over by twigs and other foliage. It doesn't just destroy one life. And then you find out what really happened. You read it in books, you see it in TV shows and everything else. It's really tough. Well, there isn't a day go by that you don't remember something. It tears communities apart. When I arrived at the scene, the first thing I went and saw was a body in the wood. It's up to the police to not only solve the mystery and track down the killer, but bring them to justice. From a forensic point of view, perhaps the most fascinating aspect of this case is that a conviction was achieved without the body. In this episode, the horrendous murder of a retired military man. It was overkill in every sense of the word. It was like someone had lost literally all control, impulse, and just savaged the man. Meet the murder detectives. I've worked over 300 cases as a lead investigator. This case takes the cake. Who reveal how they caught the killer. You know, that old saying, there's no honor among thieves, well, that also includes prostitutes. Sacramento is the capital city of the U.S. state of California. In 1991, it was a troubled city, reporting more than a hundred murders. On March the 7th, Detective John Cabrera got a call about a homicide that would baffle all involved. I was home and had just finished dinner with my family, and uh, I was on call which we are on in homicide, we're basically 24 and seven. So I just get all my equipment and everything I need and I got in my car and I headed out to the crime scene. What John had been told was a body had been discovered concealed in a small closet in a mobile home. There he was, the victim was lying on his stomach. He had a white plastic bag tied around his head. He was just bloody uh, all over all over the place. I started looking at him carefully and I could see stab wound after stab wound, multiple stab wounds. Also at the scene was Deputy Coroner Jesse Villalobos, who examined the lacerations on the body. They're so numerous I didn't bother to count. It was evidently of a puncture wound of some type that was consistent with the scene that I saw outside. If you're being stabbed repeatedly and fighting off, there's going to be blood scattered, spread, just shed everywhere. John had been told the victim was a 58-year-old male named Philip Inhofer. Tony Harvey, a local journalist, picked up the story. Mr. Inhofer was a retired military man. He worked here in Sacramento at the uh, McCullen Air Force Base. I think he had just retired from the Air Force and he was working as a civilian. The person who had notified the police was Philip's son. He had a call from his father's work to say he hadn't shown up. His son, Henry Inhofer, found a body March 7, 1991. And what, he walks into the mobile home and he finds his dad naked with a plastic bag over his head, bleeding everywhere. Just terrible the way he died. Horrible the way he died. You know, and especially, you know, one of your family members, your oldest son, who walks in and he finds you in this state. He didn't see a lot of his dad when he was growing up because his dad was in the military moving around. So they didn't have the greatest relationship at this time. And since Philip Inhofer had moved to Sacramento, this was his opportunity to bond with his dad. Then the next thing you know, you find out that he's dead. Philip's home was in a mobile home park in North Natomas, seven miles from downtown Sacramento. On the night I came out here, it was cold, it was dark, and it was nothing like it is today. This mobile home park sat out here by itself. And so if you're ever going to commit a crime, what better place where you had nobody around? 
John secured the crime scene and he and his team searched it for clues as to what may have taken place. There was a large blood stain in the carpet. And as I started to scan in the room and looking up at the ceiling, I could see blood all over, little drops of blood. In fact, there was a mist of blood on top, which is significant to me because it tells me he was hit with something so hard that the blood basically vaporizes and flies up and then sticks to the walls. It was clear Philip had not been killed in the closet where he was found. John was keen to locate where the initial attack may have taken place. So I moved on. I looked into the bathroom, and there it was. This bathroom was just full of blood. The shower curtain had been sliced or cut, and there was blood all over the walls inside the tub, blood on the floor. So I knew this was where everything happened. Although horrific, this type of random killing wasn't unusual in Sacramento at the time. There was a series of homicides that pretty much ripped the uh, city apart and uh, was just changing the whole culture of uh, how we were living here in Sacramento. And most of these homicides were committed by uh, serial killers. Shootings, you name it. I think 93 is when we set a homicide record for Sacramento. I think it was like 165 homicides, both city and county. Detective John Cabrera and his homicide unit down at the Sacramento Police Department were working most of these crimes, and they solved just about 90% of those crimes. Literally, I spent half my career working murders. Everything from shootings, stabbings, probably some of the worst types of murders that anybody could imagine. I've worked over 300 cases as a lead investigator. This case takes the cake. The crime scene shocked everyone, including Deputy Coroner Jesse Villalobos. You just looked up and you saw blood everywhere. So right off the bat, you said this is unusual because most people don't expend that much effort to kill another human being. There seemed to be no thought about consequences. Definitely the killer knew the victim. It was obvious the, the point of murder was actually in the bathroom or in the shower. So that would indicate that the victim was quite comfortable with the killer around the premises at the time and he was in the shower. So there would be a level of comfort, almost friendliness, the victim and the killer. It was just unbelievably horrific. They weren't just stab wounds. I believe his skull was fractured, if I remember correctly. Whoever had done this had to have enough energy and strength to drag the victim, and he wasn't a small person. John believed the killer must have been physically tough to overpower Philip. The blood on the floor provided the team with clues to Philip's last movements. The nature of all that blood means it was a very violent encounter and it also meant that he was struggling for his life. He just did not suddenly go down with the first couple of attacks, whether it was a knife or the bludgeoning. He definitely fought. I started to piece together that if the victim was taking a shower, then the perpetrator would have had to attack them, first of all, in the shower. And then it looked like the victim stepped out of the shower, possibly to defend themselves, reaching out at the person who was attacking them. And by doing so, was flailing blood all over the bathroom, all over the sink. And a pair of glasses that had belonged to the victim was lying on the sink. It appeared that he never even had time to put his glasses on. A good deal of homicides actually aren't planned. They are spontaneous events. And so unless you're somebody that routinely walks around with a weapon, for example, a knife, then you would just be picking up something that was to hand. Knives are readily available inside people's homes. It's more suggestive of a determined effort to kill if you're using a gun or a knife. It takes a lot of energy to kill someone that way. So you have to have a lot, a lot of rage, hate, anger, whatever you want to call it. It's work. 
It was clear that the murder had been violent, but John had no idea of a motive. The only possible clue was that Philip's son had revealed his father's car was missing. Mr. Inhofer's car was a 450 SL Mercedes-Benz. He always parked it in the carport. The neighbors always saw it. What was unique about the victim's Mercedes-Benz? The numbers on the license plate started out 666. Could this be a motive for the murder? It was clear there was more to this case than met the eye, and the team were no closer to catching the killer. I knew this was going to be a real jigsaw puzzle. John had to get justice for Philip Inhofer's murder, and the clock was ticking. Fifty-eight-year-old Philip Inhofer had been brutally murdered in his mobile home in Sacramento. His car was missing, but other than that, lead detective John Cabrera didn't have any clues. What was the motive? Why would someone bludgeon this victim so horribly? What was it? I didn't see the possibility that it was a robbery murder because I didn't see any of the drawers ransacked or pulled out. When examining the crime scene, it became clear the killer had attempted to cover their tracks. They tried to fix it up enough that nothing seemed out of the ordinary. You see all of this blood, but then it's cleaned up. The attempt to clean is an interesting one. It's almost as if the person was then showing remorse. The theory behind covering a victim's head is that they want to personalise the damage that has been caused or personalise the victim. John and the team collected telephone records and notebooks from Mr Inhofer's home. But there was no murder weapon and little in the way of forensic evidence. Only one thing gave John hope. While in the bedroom then, I looked on the nightstand and there I found was a piece of paper with the name Jade Cabody. And I thought this is significant because this person was somebody known or maybe somebody special to the victim because... It's right here on his nightstand. Why would you have somebody's name, phone number, if it wasn't somebody that you maybe had contact with? They had their first lead. John and the team needed to find Jade Cabading, and this experienced team knew just how to do it. In these types of homicides, you first work from the inside out. You know, we have to start talking to family. You have to start talking to immediate neighbors. John interviewed Philip's devastated family and had no reason to suspect them. A small break came when he spoke to Philip's next-door neighbours. It was late in the evening on March 5th and he and his wife were sitting in the mobile home park and it's so quiet out there, but he was hearing a banging noise and he thought, what is going on so late at night? So he actually stepped out of his mobile home and walked over toward the victim's mobile home, which is where the noise was coming from. And he heard this thump, thump, thump. And immediately I thought it was probably the assailant beating on the victim, Mr. Enhofer. This theory tied in with the evidence of the attack Deputy Coroner Jesse found on Philip's body. It's a big flat blow, like a stick or a bat, for example. If you hit someone, you'll see it. There's all the associated marks. You'll see contusions, big, massive bruising. The statement from the witnesses gives me a, a window of when this murder might have occurred. It was March 5th, late in the evening, almost midnight. John may have nailed the timing of the murder, but the motive was still a complete mystery. He widened his search for suspects. Perhaps somebody known to Philip had a reason to kill him. As the days went by and we were gathering more information, of course we were starting with relatives, people that knew him, close people, people at work, people that might have had a problem with him. Nobody. Nothing. I mean, what we did find out is he was a gentle person. He was kind, a loving father, a loving grandfather. It appeared he had no enemies. He was just a good man. 
I think it's less the character of the victim and more the lifestyle of the victim that's probably quite important to the police. So they do something called victimology, which is basically they explore as much as they can about the victim's life, lifestyle, background, habits, sorts of places they go, where do they spend their money, what do they spend it on, who are the people that they communicate with, who are the people that they meet face to face with. Usually indicates how a person lives will give you an indicator how they died. Nothing made sense. John began to research Philip's private life to see if there was more to this ex-military gentleman than met the eye. When he retired, you know, he got himself a good job and he moved into a mobile home park and he wanted a peaceful life. He wanted to have some company. And he went out with a lot of people from his work. But for some reason, he just seemed to gravitate toward women that were part of an escort service. People do use prostitutes. In fact, on an astounding level, facts and figures of prostitution usually knock people off their feet because it's much more prevalent than you realise. The victim was certainly someone who was going through a midlife crisis, but he was a goldfish in a very deep pool and was going to be hooked by the perpetrator. There's no true love in these uh, relationships. This is pure business. This revelation shed new light on the investigation. If Philip was using cool girls, he'd opened himself up to a dangerous world. The use of prostitutes is not like going to the dentist. Unfortunately, what comes with it is the background of the illicit side of prostitution, the pimps, the use of force for money, the fact that really they're only interested in your money, not in you. And that is sometimes very difficult for people who use prostitutes to understand. John started to suspect the name on the nightstand could be connected to Philip's use of escort services. I asked some people if they knew who Jade was. No one knew a Jade. No one. We knew the women that he did date, but no one knew this person who went by the name of Jade Cabotting. With an all-points bulletin known as an APB out on the Mercedes and dozens of statements already taken, John turned to Philip's phone records for clues. One call stood out as a number Philip had no connection to. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to call this phone number and I'm going to ask him, what is this phone number doing in a dead man's phone bill? And I asked if he knew a person by the name of Jade. He said, I do recall a person by the name of Jade. And I do remember she used my phone to make a phone call to an individual down in Sacramento whom she says she was going to visit. The man on the phone told John that Jade had been in a car accident and that he had stopped to help her. It's there she started to talk about who she was, you know, her name Jade, and that she was going to Sacramento to pick up her Mercedes Benz. And I kept asking him, what other information did he have on this person, Jade? And he said, well, she told us that she was a prostitute, that she worked at Mustang Ranch. There, I just felt a good amount of evidence and clues had been obtained. John had struck gold. The witness connected Jade to the missing Mercedes and gave John a lead on where she worked, the Mustang Ranch. This is the first legal brothel in the United States of America. Mustang Ranch is a very well-known brothel in Nevada, just outside of Reno. I've heard the name and I've known that it existed since I was a young teen. John discovered Jade was a licensed prostitute and a driver's ID had been used to register this name. John hoped this would lead to her true identity. And now I was able to put a face to Jade. And I was actually able to find out who Jade was. Jade, in fact, was a Michelle Comiskey, a 19-year-old 
prostitute. She was about five foot six, she was tall, green eyes, very attractive, and she got what she wanted, and she used her looks and her sex appeal. I don't think these men knew how old she was. But as Mustang Ranch was in the neighboring state of Nevada, John called in a favor and got Reno homicide detectives to escort him to the Mustang Ranch brothel. Well, the first time we all walked in, the girls got up out of the bar area and all started walking toward us, lining up. And of course, we were like, no girls, we're law enforcement, so, you know, take a seat. You know, that old saying, uh, there's no honor among thieves, well, that also includes prostitutes. Because the information we were able to obtain from those that worked around her was enormous. John learned that at just 19, Michelle had already been married twice and was rumored to have tried to kill one of her husbands. Since then, sex and violence seemed to follow her. Comiskey was very comfortable in a world of violence and fear. She didn't actually have very much empathy, but she had that psychopathic ability to charm. She had that power over others that she could abuse to the hilt. We were starting to find out things that she was talking about, and it kept coming up. She kept talking about this fellow that she had down in Sacramento, and he had a Mercedes Benz, and she was gonna get the Mercedes Benz, even if she had to kill for it. With all the stories John had heard, he had one question on his mind. Was this a Black Widow type killer? A serial killer? Only a 2,000 mile hunt would reveal the answer and the truth about this woman, soon to be known as the Batgirl. John Cabrera's investigation of the murder of Philip Inhofer had led him to the infamous Mustang Ranch brothel in Nevada, where Jade, real name Michelle Comiskey, worked as a call girl. The evidence so far was pointing to the 19-year-old escort having killed Philip in order to steal his car. She apparently was driven to the point where whatever it took, she was going to get this Mercedes-Benz. Philip Inhofer, he was spending loads of money on her, buying her clothes and, you know, jewelry and all type of materialistic things. But she wanted that car. And she kept him busy with her sex appeal. Escorts at the ranch told John that Comiskey had grown up in Iowa. I was just startled by how much she had done since the age of 14. She was a runaway at the age of 14. She took off to Florida on her own. But she was able to survive, and she survived by using whatever means necessary. And if it meant prostituting herself, well, that's what she did. Some say she was kind of dingy out of her mind. Others say she was bright and intelligent. The last thing was, she was just a dreamer, living in a materialistic world. First husband attempted to attack. Second husband, she attempts to kill with rat poison. They actually saw Jade putting the rat poison in her husband's food. She began in an awful way to learn how to manipulate others using her sexuality. She could get favors for sex, and this was a very crude learning curve that she continued throughout her life. By the time she was an adult, her sexual prowess and her ability to manipulate people using those skills was phenomenal. I think she started drinking and taking drugs before she left Iowa. And later on, you know, it leads to marijuana. Marijuana leads to cocaine. Cocaine leads to LSD. And then it leads to this person named Jay Cabatting that she created. According to colleagues, when Comiskey was working as Jade, she would often do several hits of LSD and still work the night. LSD is classified as a hallucinogenic and its effects are specific to the individual. If they have a lot of rage, it can release that. It depends solely on the person's mental status and the issues they have. 
Was she capable of doing this? She talked about it. LSD, methamphetamine. Now looking at the crime scene, there was no doubt in my mind. Yes, she was very capable of this. Further investigations revealed Comiskey had previous history with men and their mercs, but John needed more if he was going to get an arrest warrant. He spoke to every known associate of Jade's until he got what he was looking for. We had found her former roommate, and that was huge. But what she told us was just incredible, that she had picked up Jade, or as we know, Michelle Comiskey now, and March 5th, drove her down to Sacramento to Mr. Anhofer's mobile home. The former roommate turned against Comiskey and was happy to reveal all about the trip, including a stop at a hardware store where the young prostitute had a rather strange request. Jade made an inquiry about some decon rat poisoning, and she'd asked the clerk, if you were to give this to someone, would it make them sick? And he said, yeah, I believe it would. You know, why would you ask those questions? John had heard rumours that Comiskey had previously tried to kill her former husband using rat poison. It was all making sense. Now she was able to put Jade in her car, driving her to the victim's house, and then leaving Jade there. So now we know who our killer was. But John had doubts about Jade's roommate and fellow prostitute's reliability as a witness. Yeah, what makes a good witness is a really interesting question. Detectives will be making judgments about the kind of background they're from. Are they criminally involved? What was their connection to the victim, to the suspect? Because all of these have implications for the account that that person might give and the sorts of things that they might miss out, actively choose not to include. Although it was hard to believe this sweet-looking 19-year-old was capable of such a brutal attack, John was led by the evidence. On or about March 25th, I was able to secure a warrant for her arrest based on all the information we had. She was now wanted for this brutal murder. The hunt was on. Comiskey's last known address was in Citrus Heights, 15 miles outside Sacramento where it was believed she ran an escort service out of her bedroom. What we found out through the apartment manager is that Jade and her roommate had taken off during the middle of the month without even paying the rent. And apparently they'd loaded up all their stuff and took off. But as far as we were concerned, she wasn't here and she was on the move. Comiskey had been on the run for a month. Finding her was not going to be simple. John called in the FBI. They were able to put out a UFAP warrant, a warrant that the feds use for people that are avoiding prosecution in one state, and they flee. People on the run are good news stories. Um, It makes people want to look and find them themselves. When that person is a very glamorous, sexually overt person on the run, and that person has actually committed murder, you have the two main items that hit headlines, that sell papers. The blonde killer was sure to catch the public's attention, but unless John found solid evidence against her, she could still avoid conviction. He got an address for a storage unit Comiskey rented in the hope it would hold vital clues, perhaps even the murder weapon. Going into the storage shed, it was just a lot of boxes. There was a lot of things that related to Batman, you know, pictures, photographs. We were told about the tattoos. She had a ring of bats around her left arm. Vampire bite marks on her neck with drips of blood coming down. She told people she was uh, into Satan and all that kind of stuff. I knew that there wasn't any way we could let this case die. I had to keep it in the newspaper. Years of experience had taught John how to use the media to his best advantage. In an interview with a Sacramento Bee journalist, John had an idea of how to make the story stick. I came up with the name Batgirl. I saw her face light up. And for that brief moment, it was like a 
a light went on. And uh, she wrote an article about the Batgirl, and it took off like wildfire across the United States. The Batgirl case was the talk of the town. You had to read about it. You had to cut on your television and find out what was going on. She had a big impact on this community at that time. As the nation read about the Batgirl, the FBI used their resources to help gather statements, and John started to pin down where she might be. We did it the old-fashioned way. A lot of footwork, a lot of phone calls, a lot of favors. The networking in the U.S., um, it's just the greatest thing in the world. John believed she was heading to Miami and tracked her route. People would call in Los Angeles and say uh, she was down here, but she isn't here now. Or where did she say she was going? I think she was heading to Phoenix. We'd get a hold of the people in Phoenix. We got calls from Phoenix. Yes, she works for me. And then we also found out that while she was in Phoenix, Arizona, knowing that people already knew about the bat ring on her arm, she had a tattoo put over it, covering the bats. But she left the bite marks on her neck. We even talked to the tattoo artist that did that. But they all had different names. She gave them all different stories. More than a month had gone by, and despite all the media attention, John and the team seemed to always be one step behind the Batgirl. You learn in homicide, you can never become frustrated with anything, because sooner or later, something's going to give. These criminals are not foolproof. Someone's going to recognize them, but they're just going to make a mistake themselves. And in this particular case, lo and behold, Michelle Kaminsky made the fatal mistake herself. I was at work in the homicide unit on May 7th, 1991. My supervisor told me that Michelle Comiskey had been arrested in Biloxi, Mississippi. And I thought, good, now it starts to come to an end. Will the Batgirl confess to her crimes? And has John got enough evidence to convict her of Philip Inhofer's murder? Nineteen-year-old Michelle Comiskey, a.k.a. Jade, a.k.a. the Batgirl, was wanted for the murder of Philip Inhofer. She'd been on the run across America when her and a girlfriend were spotted having mechanical issues with their rental van in Biloxi, Mississippi. As luck would have it, just that time when they pulled over to check on what was going on in the back, the police officer sitting across the street. The officer asked Michelle Comiskey for ID, but she didn't have any. He then noticed a Mercedes-Benz in the back of the truck. It had been resprayed and didn't have any number plates. Probably Michelle didn't realize you can take the license plate off a vehicle, but every vehicle has a VIN number. That VIN number was in the system. The officer ran the VIN number, and sure enough, the car belonged to murder victim Philip Inhofer. At that time, he got back out, walked around, asked both girls to step out, and then he took both of them in custody. John had caught his killer and found the car that connected her directly to the murder. But there was still a long way to go before she could be brought to justice, and the public were watching. Everybody had to know what was going on with this thing. I go to the newspaper, hey, what's going on with the bad girl today? I mean, when she was caught in Mississippi, in Biloxi, Mississippi, I mean, Biloxi is known to have strip clubs and casino. I believe she probably just stopped there to work for a couple of days and then she was going to move on. Comiskey had run out of luck. Although John was confident of her guilt, without a murder weapon or forensic evidence, proving it in court could be difficult. What John needed was a confession. It's very critical. When you take these people into custody, that you're able to get to them and interview them before they have time to sit or to listen to a jailhouse lawyer or someone that's going to tell them, don't say a word, don't do this. My job is to get there and to try to get her to talk to me. So I was on the plane the next day and I was headed to Biloxi, Mississippi. John was hoping he could get the Batgirl to waive her rights and talk. As an experienced detective, he had a few tricks up his sleeve. 
She was thin. She looked wiry. And uh, she looked very capable of handling herself. I gave her her Miranda rights. I gave her an opportunity not to speak to me. But she agreed to speak with me, giving up her rights. In America, detectives are really good at getting suspects to waive their Miranda rights, which is your right to remain silent and your right to have a solicitor present. But by getting suspects to waive those rights, detectives then have a kind of inroads to interrogate their suspects. And the first question I asked her, I said, are you Michelle Comiskey? And she looked right at me and she said, I don't know who I am. And immediately I thought, here we go. It's game time. I just looked straight at her and I asked her, did you stab Philip Enhofer? She wouldn't answer. She wouldn't answer. What she would tell me is that she hurt him. She admitted to being with Philip that day and that they'd been shopping. She then revealed her version of events the night of Philip Inhofer's death. We're going to take a shower. And then she says, you know, Philip's in the shower and I take LSD. She must have took large doses of this drug. And all of a sudden, she started having these psychological effects. I start to see a monster. And when I go into the bathroom, I see this monster. I see these snakes coming out of its neck. And Satan tells me to hurt this person. And that's what she told me. Satan told me to do it. Satan told me to hurt Philip Enhoff. That's when she went to work on him, you know, with a knife. But she never told me she stabbed him. When I asked her about the taking of the Mercedes, she said, well, Satan told me to take the car because the license plate was 666. And I thought for a moment that she was trying to spin something in this interview like she was out of her mind, she didn't know what was going on. But you know what? She kills him. She stabs him 32 times. She breaks the knife off in his chest. Then she beats him with the baseball bat. After that, what does she do? She have enough sense that now she's cleaning up the crime scene. She didn't just go goofy and run out the door and get in the car and take off. That's what you would expect. She does that. And then meticulously loads up the car with all the evidence, all the bloody towels, puts her suitcases in there, and drives away. So for me to think that she was on LSD, she didn't know what was going on, she was out of her mind, I didn't buy very much of that. There was no doubt that she went to the house that night with the sole intention of committing the murder and stealing the car. Her actions then become erratic. It appears that she had sexual intercourse with the victim beforehand and then engaged in this violent attack with no remorse. Comiskey's statement was damning. John flew the Batgirl back to Sacramento on a first-degree murder charge. When John arrived in the city with Jade in tow, the media went wild. Bringing Jade back after she had been arrested, I'll never forget. It was just uh, unbelievable. Everybody wanted to get a glimpse of this young girl. Since Sacramento was becoming accustomed to these type of crimes, you had to know what was going on. Jade was in jail and she wasn't allowed to have bail. And that's because it's a murder charge. And in most murder charges, you don't have bail. So she was going to be housed in there all the way up until her court proceedings. The Batgirl may have been in custody, but John's work was far from over. He had to gather as much evidence as possible to secure a conviction. Philip Inhofer's stolen Mercedes was his first port of call. It appeared to be like bloodstains in the back carpet, and that would make sense since she said that she threw these bloody towels in there. In the cab of the rental truck, I found an aluminum baseball bat. It appeared that there was smudged blood on it. And then it just struck me. This is the weapon she used on the victim to smash his face in. 
John also found a briefcase with more vital evidence. It contained a ledger listing all the hundreds and hundreds of men Comiskey had slept with for money. And whose name did I find? I found Philip Inhofer's name in there. In the amount of money? $500. This evidence further connected Comiskey to Philip. It seemed the Batgirl's days were numbered. I was told that it was going to be a death penalty case. She killed a victim for his car, and that's how it was going to be presented. In death penalty cases in California are usually around first-degree murders. It would depend on the level of severity because a murder is still a murder, but was it premeditated, was it planned, was it connected to gangs, or was it an instantaneous act? Michelle Comiskey, a.k.a. Jade, was first put in front of a grand jury to decide if there's enough evidence to go to trial on a charge of murder. Michelle pleaded not guilty. She just sat there motionless. She uh, was dressed up in a dress, nothing flamboyant. It looked like a girl going to Sunday school. The grand jury sat for six weeks and was presented with all the evidence John had acquired. The baseball bat, the witness statements, the ledger and the blood in the car. Their conclusion was that there was enough evidence to go to trial. She was held over to Superior Court uh, to stand trial for first-degree murder. It was during this period, as both sides prepared, that they agreed to a plea of guilty and a sentence, which would enable her the possibility of being paroled somewhere in her life. Comiskey had made a deal that admitted her guilt and sentenced her to 26 years to life in jail, saving her from the death penalty. It also meant that this case would not be in a courtroom, that there would not be a jury of 12, that there would not be media in the courtroom. It was a result, but not one that pleased everybody. I think the family members... And I think people that knew him, friends, were very disappointed. And I think they really wanted her to serve life. And in some cases, people thought she should be on death row. Journalist Tony Harvey wrote to her in jail to request an interview. And on his third letter, she replied. These are her words. I live with my murderer, Mr. Inhofer, every single day. As the years go by, my understanding and reverence for his life gets deeper and sadder. I took this man from his family, friends, and everyday living. He deserves life. Every time I come off the parole, I victimize them all over again, making them relive the horror. Sir, I am not the same young woman. Today I am full moral knowledge of my actions. This sounds like a woman who wants to be free. My personal opinion on on people is simply this. Everybody can kill. Given the right circumstances, anybody can kill. It amazes me that more humans don't kill each other. I'm so glad that we were able to take her into custody because who knows where it would have ended up. Some people ask me, do you think she would have become a serial killer? You know, a serial killer doesn't have to kill three people. It was just a good thing that we were able to take her out of society. There isn't a day that I don't look back, given we didn't have the technology that law enforcement has today. But we gave it our all, and using what we had, we were successful. And I'm very proud of that. Pick another destination for Ross Kemp, but don't expect him to be sunning himself in the Costas. Tough Talks in Extreme World, Monday at 10, then at 11, unmissable real-life stories as we hit the beat and show those criminals who's boss in Brick Ops. <laughs>